If you don't mind, before we start our message, let's just start with a word of prayer. Dylan Father, Lord our God, Lord, how amazing you are. And Lord, today we have the opportunity to be here on your Sabbath and to praise you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you open our hearts and our minds to your Holy Spirit, Lord. And may the message today touch our heart. And Lord, may we just draw closer to you. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. So this morning, I brought a present. And I know when I first brought it, some of the deacons asked, they're like, oh, is there another, another baptism? And I was like, no, 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 it's an illustration. But I don't know about you, but who here likes gifts? Raise your hand. You know, I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody who said, you know, I really don't like presents. Like, I have horror presents. Please don't give me a present. I don't think I've ever spoken to someone who just hates gifts. Have you? I mean, think about it. When we go to a Walmart and it's buy one, get one free, we like that. It's like a free gift. And you know, talking about gifts, it reminds me of Christmas. And you, do you remember as like a little child, you know, the, the days before Christmas, leading up to Christmas, the, the, the presents were under the Christmas tree. And I remember as a little kid, I didn't believe in purgatory. But the days before Christmas felt like it because there they were. But I wasn't allowed to open them till Christmas Day. And you know, I, I still remember this, this day, the joy of waking up on Christmas Day and getting to open the presents. But you know what? Something interesting happens. When you get older, the gift of receiving presents kind of shifts to giving presents, doesn't it? I mean, there's nothing better than finding that perfect gift. You find that perfect gift that you know is everything they could ever want or desire and seeing that expression of joy on their face. It's just a split second, but when you see that expression, it's all worth it. And you know, for me, I'll be honest, my love language isn't giving gifts. I love doing it, but it doesn't come easy. You know, and if you're like me, if, you're, if, if your love language isn't giving gifts, you understand when you're going shopping to go find gifts, it's an all day ordeal. I mean, you block out your whole calendar for at least a day or two. Because you, you're not just going to be walking in there and, and find it right off, right off the spot. But you see, on the other hand, if you, if you are a gift giver, see, my grandma is. And she's so good at giving gifts. I mean, she can walk into the store and she can find the perfect thing for you. And when you get it, you'll look at it and you wouldn't even imagine you wanted it, but it's perfect. She just has a gift of giving gifts, but I, I don't have that gift. So for me, every time when Christmas comes around, it's a struggle. And if you're in the same boat as me, you understand because finding the perfect gift takes days, sweat, tears, and if you're going shopping on Black Friday, maybe even blood. <laughs> but once you find that perfect gift, there's that joy, isn't it? Because you found it. But then after you find the perfect gift, it, it, it doesn't get better, it gets worse because then you have to wait to give it to them. You know, and have you had that, where you had that perfect gift but you have to wait like two weeks to give it to him. And you even hit it like, I found the perfect gift. And you're going to love it. It's like, oh, what is it? I, I can't tell you. But then finally you get to give him that perfect gift. And you see that expression on their face. And it's worth it, isn't it? The time, the tears, the sweat, maven blood. It's worth it when you see that look on their face as they open the perfect gift. And you know, that's how Jesus felt right before he left us to go to heaven. He had the perfect gift for you and me, and he couldn't wait for us to open it. So as we start this morning, I'd like for you to join me in Acts chapter 1. So open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 In, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And, you know, I just want to stop here. As we read this, it says, He gave them many infallible proofs. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us what those infallible proofs are. But I can only imagine what they are, can't you? And I, and I don't know about you, but I can't wait till we get to heaven. 
and we get that HD, 4D, you know, whatever, and we get to watch Jesus' life. And we'll be able to see what did Jesus do during these 40 days. But well, let's continue. In verse 4 it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the, whole, of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and to all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what was that perfect gift? The Holy Spirit. The gift that Jesus wanted to give us was his Holy Spirit. Now I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 5. So turn with me to John chapter 16, verse 5. And God's word says, But now I go away to, go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So can you imagine Jesus telling the disciples this? Because I don't know about you, but what could be better than having Jesus right here? Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, if Jesus was in Keene, none of us would be here. Would we all be over there, right? But he said it was to our advantage that he left. Why is that? Well, you see, Jesus, when he came to this world and he became flesh, he lost one of his divine attributes. Because, you see, no longer was Jesus omnipresent. He couldn't be at all places at once. And so even when he was here, the disciples had to look for him. The disciples had to find him. So he knew that if he stayed here, he couldn't be there for every single one of us. I mean, can you imagine I'm going through a hard time, you're going through a hard time, and he'd have to pick which one to be with. So by Jesus leaving, we receive his Holy Spirit. So now, Jesus doesn't have to choose who he has to be with, because he can be with every single one of us at the same time. Amen. Now I want you to turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 16. And before I read this text, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever received a gift? You know, it's Christmas time, it's your birthday. And have you ever received a gift, and you know, you open it up, and you're looking into it, and you have no clue what it is? Have you ever had that? And, and, and it's that, that moment where you're trying to be polite, and you open it up, and you're like, oh, I love it. What is it? <laughs> have you ever done that? You know, our topic today is the Holy Spirit, and I feel like many of us, we know that God's perfect gift for us is the Holy Spirit. But I think many of us, and, and I could be in the same, and I'm in the same category, we received the Holy Spirit, but we kind of received it, we opened it, we said, oh, cool, what is it? And you know, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we kind of get a little anxious because we see so, how some other churches use the Holy Spirit, and, and we're just not sure really what to do with it. So this morning, I want us to go through the Bible. I want us to go, we're going to go to John chapter 14. And let's see how Jesus says to use his Holy Spirit. What is his Holy Spirit for? So back here in John chapter 14, verse, starting in verse 16. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, 
For he dwells with you, and I will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And you know what's so amazing about this? Is that Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's talking to them right before he's going to be on Calvary, before he's going to die on the cross. And he knows what is going to be before the disciples. He knows the temptations, the trials. And just before, he had told the disciples that he's leaving them. But what does he say? When I leave you, who's going to come? The Holy Spirit. Or my Bible says the helper. Yours might say the comforter. But you know, when Jesus said it, and it's written here in the Greek, when he said it, he would have said the word parakletos. And when he said the word parakletos, I don't know about you, but that really means nothing, doesn't it? If Jesus says, I'm leaving you, but don't worry, the parakletos is coming. You'd be, what? The, the who? But do you know what the word parakletos literally means? Para, the first part, means beside or on one side. And kletos literally means comforter. So when he said parakletos, he said, I'm leaving you, but the comforter that walks beside you will come to you. And think how, how amazing this one has been to the disciples. Because Jesus was just telling them that he's going to leave them. But he said, don't you worry, because my comforter, who will be right beside you, is coming. And you see, Jesus knew that they would need the comforter. And that's why he said it would be to our advantage that he left. Because you see, if you turn with me to John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus knew that they'd be persecuted. And he says so himself. And in, jo in John chapter 15, verse 26 and 27, it says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify me. And you will also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Continuing to chapter 16, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think they have offered God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. You see, Jesus knew that his disciples would go through hard times. But even more, Jesus knew that we would go through hard times. Because the Christian walk isn't easy, is it? We all face trials and temptations. And how wonderful is it that Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit to be a comforter, to give us strength during the hard times. And so you see, when we're going through these hard times, all we have to do is pray. Because since the Comforter is right beside us, that means he's only a prayer away. We don't have to go far to get comfort, do we? Because he's right there beside us. Because Jesus knew that we would need someone to strengthen us and to give us comfort. But there's also something else. If you go with me to John chapter 16, verse 13, we see the second purpose of the Holy Spirit. It says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truths for he will not speak of his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will tell you things to come so here we see that the second purpose of the holy spirit is to be the spirit of truth right it's to help us understand god's word now i have a question has anybody here ever used a global positioning system a GPS. Raise your hand if you ever use a GPS. I use one weekly. But do you remember the, the good old days when you had to take out those foldable maps and you'd be going on a road trip and you're going somewhere you've never been before and as you're going there you have to plot out your route. But you're always worried because, you know, when you drive on those long road trips, you kind of daze off. You know, you've been on the road for a long time and when you finally snap back out to it, you're like, oh, wait, am I, am I on the right road? But now with GPS, it's so easy, isn't it? Because we have that little voice that says, turn right, turn right. And, and we, don't, we don't have to worry if we're on the right way because we have the GPS. And all we got to do is, is put the address in 
and it'll either take us to where we want to go or to a random field. <laughs> but either way, isn't it nice that we have the GPS? But you know, God, He has a GPS system too. And it's the way that He wants to communicate to us the direction to go home. Amen. And His GPS is God, the prophets, and the Spirit. And that's how God uses to communicate to us the directions to go home. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad God has given us a GPS. Because I don't know about you, but I'm a little directionally challenged. And I'm not talking about driving, but I'm talking about in life. Because I know what I'm supposed to do. We know what we're supposed to be doing, right? But for some reason, we know we're supposed to be going left, but we want to go right because we think that's the right way. But isn't that amazing that God has given us his Holy Spirit to keep us going down the right path? Continue with me in verse, in chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 8. And it says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You see, when, when the, you see, the Holy Spirit is here to help us continue on the right path. And even more, as, if, as we read in Isaiah 31, or th Isaiah 30, verse 21, it says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left hand. So here we see that it's the Holy Spirit that as we're going down life, if we're going down the wrong way, he's the one who convicts us of our sin, who whispers in our ear, who pleads with us, turn around, repent, go the right way. But you know what's so amazing? Not only is it the Holy Spirit that tells us which way to go, but it's the Holy Spirit that once we turn and go the right way, once we start following God, that he gives us strength to continue to walk after God. So not only does he tell us which way to go, but he helps us get there. <clears throat> and you know, I don't know about you, but many times, you know, we get a fork in the road in life. You know, and sometimes I've heard people say, man, I just wish I knew what I was supposed to do. I just wish I heard God calling to me, telling me which way to go. And you know, it reminds me of a story of my little sister. Um, she was four years old. And my mom was trying to teach her about the Holy Spirit. And as she was te teaching her about the Holy Spirit, she says, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's that still, small voice. And you've got to be really, really quiet because he's trying to tell you the right thing to do. But if you're not really quiet, you're going to miss it. You know what my little sister said? She said, I know, I keep telling him to speak up, but he won't. <laughs> you know, in our own lives, as we're going down the way, I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like the Holy Spirit isn't saying anything, doesn't it? But you know, I don't think it's that the Holy Spirit isn't speaking. Sometimes I think he's yelling at us, but we've gotten just so accustomed to ignoring him. And you see, this isn't a new thing because in Acts 7 verse 51, it says, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart, and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so did you. And in Jeremiah 7.24 it says, they did not obey or incline their ears, but followed the dictates of their own hearts and went backwards and not forwards. You know, we can become so accustomed to ignoring the Holy Spirit that we can't hear him anymore. And that's why every time we hear that still small voice and it's telling you to do something, you want to know the simple answer? Do it. <clears throat> As the slogan for Nike, just do it. If the, if the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, do it. And what you'll find out is the next time when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you'll hear it a little louder, and then you'll do it. And then keep on going until the only voice you hear is the Holy Spirit. And, well, let's continue. <clears throat> well, let's con continue and see what, uh, what other things the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit will help us with. Continuing in verse 11, it says, Of judgment because the rulers of this world is judged. And then verse 12, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truths, for he will speak 
um, will speak on his, not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. And what's so amazing is, can you imagine poor Jesus? I mean, Jesus had so much he wanted to tell the disciples. And for anyone here who's ever been a student or a teacher, you understand as humans, we can only understand so much information at once. So can you imagine poor Jesus, because he has all this he wants to tell the disciples, but they could only comprehend this much. But guess what? He was able to give, and he able to give us and the disciples his Holy Spirit. So today, you and I, we can be taught as the disciples were by Jesus. Because you see, every time we open up God's word, it's a, mo it's a moment, it's an opportunity to commune with God, to commune with Jesus. And you see, this shows why when we open God's word, we need to bathe God's word in prayer. Before we open God's word, we need to say, Jesus, God, will you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Will you open up my eyes, open up my ears? Help me see what your word has for me today. And you know, and as you're reading the Bible, we need to be co constantly in prayer. Because if we're not constantly in prayer, as humans, we could have the tendency to tell God what we think his word says. You know, you, you can get some weird, weird Bible studies if you're trying to tell God what his word says. For example, I just want to show you, because you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to. Real quickly, this is probably the shortest Bible study you'll ever hear. But it's two verses. Go with me to Matthew 27, verse 5. Matthew 27, verse 5. And in Matthew 27, verse 5, it says, Then he, Judas, threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself. And then in Luke chapter 10, verse 37, it says, And Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. So if you try to make the Bible say what you wanted to say, you can make it say some crazy things, can't you? I mean, could you imagine if I was trying to preach from this text? Not in context, don't worry. This, nowhere in the Bible does it say do suicide or to follow in Judah's footsteps. But can you imagine if we try to make the Bible say what we wanted to say? Right now, I could be doing an altar call saying, right now, if you want to follow and do what Jesus told you to do, we have the nooses here up on the stage. Come on up. You see, you can get some crazy things when we try to tell God what he said, which is why we need the Holy Spirit, which is why we need the spirit of truth. And when we study God's word, we need to allow God to tell us what he has to say. And you know what the amazing thing is? is when you study God's word, God wants you to understand his word. He does. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. So you know when you're studying and you get to that hard, that hard passage, where you don't know what the answer is, you know what you should do? No, don't call me or Pastor Harley. <laughs> don't Google it, but you should pray. And you know, it's harder, it's not the easiest thing to do, but pray and study God's word, and I promise you, God will show you the, show you the answer. Yeah. Wrestle with God's word, wrestle with God's word in prayer, and you will find all God's truths. Because they're plain, they're simple. He wants us to understand his word. And that's why in your bulletin, if you take it out, you'll see that for every message we do, we have the sermon Bible text. Because you see, we don't want you to take our word for it. We don't want you to take Google's word for it, but we want you to take God's word for it. So after every sermon, after every Bible study, after every time you hear someone speak, I would challenge you to write down those Bible verses and study it for yourself. One, you'll probably see something I didn't. And two, you'll be able to experience God speaking to you. Because, see, God's spirit of truth wants to make God's truth plain to us. But you see, there's one more purpose that, God, that the Holy Spirit has. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit is our power. I'd like for us to turn back to Acts chapter 1. 
Turn back with me to Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're, we're going to start in verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, the disciples weren't supposed to leave until they had the Holy Spirit, until they had the power. And in our lives, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we have no power. You know, even our message doesn't have power. The three angels' messages have nothing if there's not the Holy Spirit in it. Which is why if you look at me in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, as Peter was preaching, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut, or some things say their hearts were pricked to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, is the Holy Spirit right now that gives any message power. It's only him speaking to you that can transform and change your heart. And it reminds me of a time when I preached a sermon, if you could call it a sermon, it was a dud. It was the worst sermon I ever preached. I skipped a whole point at the conclusion. I forgot what I was going to say. I was stumbling through it. And at the end, I felt as big as an ant. You know, and you, you go back and, you know, everybody's shaking your hands. And the whole time, I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. I let you down. Uh, will you forgive me? And in my heart, I'm just wrestling with God. and just, I just feel so bad. But then a woman came up to me. And she came up to me and she said, Pastor, I've been going through this. And that was exactly what I needed to hear. And she said, when you said this and when, you're, when you made this point, that's what I needed to hear. And, and I was astand, astonished and I was like, praise the Lord. So I hugged her and we left. But then I got puzzled because I remember what she said and I went back to my notes and I never made that point. I never said those words. You see, it's not about my presentation. It's not about my message, but it's about the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because he's the one who's speaking to you. He's the one who's pricking your heart right now. Because you see, my message could be as eloquent as Dwight Nelson's or as polished as Randy Roberts. But if there's no Holy Spirit in it, there's no power. And isn't that true for everything we do? I mean, if there's no power in everything we do, it's meaningless, isn't it? If the Holy Spirit isn't in us, it's meaningless. I mean, have you ever had a car and your battery went dead on you? And have you ever tried to start it? How far do you get? <laughs> Nowhere. You know, it's the same thing. If we try to start the car, if we try to do ministry without the Holy Spirit, where are we going to go? Nowhere. And you see, that's why we need the power. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. But I have a question for you. And this is a personal one. This is one for me and you. If God said one day to the Holy Spirit, let's say he said it today, and he said, Holy Spirit, you've done your job, you've, you've done enough, come up here and we'll wait till they're done and the Holy Spirit left this world today, my question for you is, would we notice it? If the Holy Spirit left today, could we tell that something was missing? Would our church still be able to run? You see, my friends, in our lives, we need the Holy Spirit. And if right now in your heart you said, I, I don't know if I would notice it, you know, it's time to allow the Holy Spirit into our heart, isn't it? You know, looking at our church as a whole through a prophetic lens in Revelation 3, what does it classify our church as? Laodicean. And it says we are the lukewarm church. And could it be that we're trying to start a car, that we're trying to move our church without the power? Could it be that we've been trying to do ministry so hard that we haven't taken time to allow God to do ministry through us. My friends, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being a lukewarm Christian. 
I don't want to be a part of this church, a part of this lukewarm church anymore. But I want to be a church that's on fire for God, don't you? Amen. And for that, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power. And next Sabbath, Pastor Harley, he's going to be talking about how to receive the power. I wish I could go on, but my time's almost up. But simply right now, in your heart, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, here's a simple prayer. Say, Holy Spirit, make me willing to be used by you. Right now, could you whisper that in your heart? Holy Spirit, make me willing to be used by you. And to close, I want to share with you a story about a, a man by the name of John Hyde. And you, see, and you see, he was also known as Praying Hyde, or Praying John. He was, a missionary to, he was a missionary in India in the early 1900s. And when he began his missionary work, he had an all-consuming burden for the salvation of souls. And the way he got the name Praying John is that he would not stop praying until a soul gave their life to Jesus. He wouldn't stop praying until someone gave their life to Jesus. And he would wrestle with prayer with God. And one year, at the beginning of the year, God convicted him to pray for one soul a day. And so John, he told his friends, he told his fellow missionaries, he said, I'm going to pray to God. And my goal is, through God, to have one soul a day come to Christ. So when his friends heard that, his friends said, man, that's, that's impossible. You're crazy. What are you thinking? But God gave him the peace and said, don't worry. I'm with you. So for a whole year, praying John or praying Hyde wrestled with God in prayer. He was spending long nights all the way to the, until the daylight praying, praying for the lost. He would fast for whole weeks. He would struggle on his knees. And you know what? Just by prayer, after the one year, over 400 people gave their life to Jesus. But you see, his story doesn't stop there. His story doesn't stop there. Because <clears throat> one of his friends wrote, after this year, reflecting on this past year, he wrote, was he satisfied? He's talking about John. Far from it. He, how could he possibly be so as long as his Lord was not? How could our Lord be satisfied so long as one single sheep was yet outside the fold? Amen. So the next year, praying John prayed for two souls a day. And after many long nights of wrestling in prayer, after fasting, after tears, after that year, over 800 people gave their life to Jesus. Amen. And just, just to make this real, real fast, our average attendance here at the Cleveland First Church is 200 to 250. So the first year, that's like two Cleveland First Churches giving their life to Jesus. The second year, oh man, that's like almost eight, or almost four, sorry, almost four ch churches giving their life to Jesus. But you know what's so amazing? John didn't stop there. He began to pray for four souls a day. And it took weeks of praying, weeks of weeping, weeks of wrestling with the Lord before once again he had the assurance that God had heard his prayer and would answer. And guess what? God is true to his, his word and he answered his prayer. His friend wrote about him saying, John seemed to always be hearing the good shepherd's voice saying, other sheep I have, other sheep I have. No matter if he won the one a day or the two a day or four a day, he had an unsatisfied longing an undying passion for lost souls. He had a passion, a desire for lost souls, and he was willing to pay a price that I don't know many of us would be. Because you see, after all those long nights, after all that time of fasting and praying, his heart actually switched sides in his chest. 
And at a young age, praying John died. What was the cause? A broken heart for lost souls. My friends, I don't know about you, but I want to be a praying John, don't you? And to do that, we need the Holy Spirit. To do that, we need to be wrestling for the salvation of our friends, for our neighbors, for the people of Cleburne on our knees. And I believe if if God will answer praying John's prayers, how much more would he answer all our prayers? Isn't it time we allowed the Holy Spirit to use us? You know, that's why this Monday, I would like to invite each and every one of you who are able to join me in the chapel. I'll be there at six o'clock in the morning. And if that's too late, I'll be there at five o'clock in the morning. Because I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being a lukewarm Christian. I want to wrestle in prayer for the lost souls. I want to be a Christian after God's own heart, don't you? And you know, Monday is my day off. So I'll be honest, it's a sacrifice. I don't know if I want to wake up that early, but Jesus sacrificed everything for me. So how can I, how can we not sacrifice little sleep? So this Monday, I'd like to invite you to wrestle with me in prayer, to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill us and to fill our community so that the lost sheep can go back to the shepherd. Amen. And if you can make it, I invite you, I'll be here at six o'clock on Monday. And if you can't be here, I understand, I know you'll be praying. But right now, to close, I want us to do something a little different. I want us individually to pray to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, make us willing to be used by you. And as you pray that, pray that prayer, and after you're done, I will close with a group prayer. So let's just take a few moments and let's pray to the Holy Spirit to make us willing to be used by him, to take away anything that could keep us from giving our whole lives to him. And let's see what God does. God wants to do marvelous things, and he's just waiting for us to work with him. So let's pray. Dear Holy Father, our most loving God, Lord, we just pray that this moment that you'll make in us a pure and clean heart. That, Lord, that you'll make us willing to be used by you. Lord, we thank you for your perfect gift, for the Holy Spirit, who is always with us, who comforts us and strengthens us, who helps us understand your word and who, Lord, is our power and our strength. Lord, we just pray that today that each and every one of us will become a praying John, that each and every one of us will have the desire and the passion to win souls for you, Lord. Lord God, we know that you are coming soon. And may our friends, may our neighbors, may our loved ones find you and give their life to you, Lord. Lord, thank you for loving us. And we praise you because we know that you are going to do wonderful and marvelous things. But Lord, may we just be willing. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.